fan of your work. I do follow your your uh, new Canvas Ventures property, and uh, it's nice to meet you finally. Yeah, likewise, and uh, thanks for all that Twitter love. I wish I was as giving as you are. So, what, what do you what do you think of this? Uh, what do you think of this uh, Afria story? It's developing. What Afria story? I haven't heard. No. <laughs> uh, you know, I was God. afraid you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm still processing it. I'm kind of upset uh, for the industry, for the company. Uh, I, I don't want to. Let me be the first to say that these short sellers, I, I don't have any problem with uh, generally the work they do. And uh, I think they serve a very valuable purpose. And I've been known to publicly criticize companies, so I have no problem with that. My big picture takeaway is that they're focusing on some very specific details, and these details may be accurate. It's I'm trying to figure out how they relate exactly to Afria, and uh, it's not clear. So, you know, to me, it was always obvious exactly what was going on, that you had insiders at Scythian, which is now SOL, that put together this deal. Sith, they ran it through Scythian for whatever reason, and then Scythian sold it to Afria. So the question becomes, if there is some sort of uh, fraudulent uh, activity, which I'm, I'm not sure there is, but it, you know, there's some funny details, uh, obviously. Uh, people who don't exist, uh, addresses that aren't there. So, But th what does this mean for Afria? And uh, I'd, I'd like to just be certain that there's no fraud at the Afria level. I, I obviously don't know that, but I don't believe that to be the case. I think the alternative, though, is it looks like maybe their due diligence process wasn't so great. And uh, my, my own take on Afria, you know, they were one of the early front runners and the company uh, was always mentioned in the same breath as uh, Aurora and, and Canopy. In fact, it was probably mentioned Canopy, Afria, and then Aurora. And uh, at this point, uh, they got behind these other companies uh, on multiple fronts. They got behind in the domestic assets, and so they bought Broken Coast uh, very early this year uh, because their mantra was always, we're going to do everything out of Leamington, out of the greenhouse. And I, I don't think that that proved to be the right strategy, at least in the short term, because of all the provincial contracts and branding and a lot of different reasons. But on the international front, I think they got way behind. So I, I, I think if, if you step back and you say, you know, what's really going on here? This is the second time they've done this deal like this, where they go out and they buy a package of assets that they didn't specifically put together. Although they were very involved in the in the due diligence process to some degree, uh, right? Uh, they were Cole, uh, one of their directors, went down to Latin America. Uh, so it's not like they were just buying this package with no due diligence. So I think it kind of tells you that that maybe they were under pressure to keep up with the other leading LPs to establish their international footprint. And they kind of had to do these deals this way. And I think the one thing that I'm most critical of is that they gave SOL free trading stock, free trading stock to. And I, I think then uh, if you look at other deals that are done in the sector, uh, they're often tied to performance and right. future payouts. And so this was 100% stock free to trade. So so the fact that they the fact that they just got listed on the New York Stock Exchange or, or, or relatively recently uh, I mean I, I you know I think it's pretty well known that the scrutiny by the New York Stock Exchange is much uh, much uh, more than it, it is in you know, in Canada, at least that's, you know, the feeling that, you know, you got to pass a lot of, go through a lot more hoops, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I right. mean, they're, they're the New York listed. So now there's, there's got to be, there's got to be a response from the New York Stock Exchange. No, I mean, uh, or is there? I'm just wondering. I'm uh, just talking. I don't know why there has to be a response. What? Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll I, play the devil's advocate. Why? Why does there have to be a response from the New York Stock Exchange? I, I, I don't. I mean, if especially if there's, uh, look, if the stock drops from, you know, twenty dollars to it's five dollars now, uh, this has all happened in a month and a half. Yeah, maybe not. I just, you know, 
the scrutiny going forward for, for this industry is going to be a lot more, you know, the magnifying glass is going to be a lot, lot bigger. There's got to be a lot more right. due diligence, you know? So at this point, I don't know why the New York Stock Exchange, yeah, I don't know why the New York Stock Exchange would be looking at anything right now. Uh, prices fall all the time or they go up, and I don't think that sure. uh, exchanges okay. micromanage. Good. If there was some information that came out that, that tied, uh, you know, the principles, you know, the, the key people at Afria to fraudulent activity, then I think that would be an issue. But th they're relying on... Uh, you know, the work of their legal counsel and an uh, outside fairness opinion. There's a whole bunch of things that are in place here that I would think would uh, protect them unless there's some sort of new evidence that comes out. Now, Alan, uh, I know you, you've been a big proponent of the U.S. sector, the, uh, the valuation uh, disparity between the U.S. sector versus the Canadian sector. Of course, the Canadian side is a lot more expensive. And you have been writing and talking about that um, right. since earlier this year, uh, in the spring, I believe. And I, I agree with you. I, I've said the same thing post-legalization, that there, there could be a chasm that, where uh, U.S. stocks start to fill in the valuation gap uh, because there's a lot more catalysts ahead of it. Now, and that's exactly what has happened. Um, you know, U.S. stocks have been outperforming Canadian ones uh, quite markedly, uh, 13 14 percent. Now, do you think the Afria situation has finally um, sort of hit U.S. stocks insofar that there's suspicion sort of going with some of the things going on most commonly seen in U.S. stocks, such as the super voting rights and all that? Do you think that there's a sort of a pull between industry practices on both sides of the border now, or is it just something that was going to, uh, you know, is it something that was just going to fill the gap anyway? Yeah, I, you know, this whole super voting stuff and all that, I don't, I don't even fully understand it, to be perfectly frank. It's become very common. Some of the older deals were not done this way. Uh, there was an uh, article in the Globe and Mail a couple weeks ago about corporate governance, and I think there were 250 uh, TSX-listed companies, and right at the bottom was, uh, I think, Aurora and Canopy right above them and Afria a few notches up. So it's, it's pretty clear. Uh, and it's, I don't think it has anything to do with the cannabis industry. I think it has more to do with new companies and new companies have to evolve and get their standards up uh, in terms of corporate governance. In the United States, I don't know that there's going to be spillover, uh, th th this voting share issue. I, I think it's troubling to, to some people, but I, I don't know that there's m more bad governance besides that. That's obviously uh, not the American way. Uh, in America, it's democracy. Everybody should get to vote. But, uh, you know, it's not like this is a big secret. Uh, all these deals come forward and it's all clearly explained. And I'm not exactly sure why they structure it this way. I've, I've tried to understand. I've, I've listened to some people and talking about these new classes of, of shares that are created. And uh, I think the, the answer from what I understand is it's to avoid having to register with the SEC. So they're registering in Canada. And they don't, but it's complicated apparently to also register with the SEC, I think. So uh, on a new issue, it's just because it's a new issue. So I don't know, it's a little bit beyond me, but uh, to your other point about the valuation gap, I didn't necessarily think Canadian valuations would go down. And I like to remind everybody, you know, Canada has the whole world and the United States is limited. But the point I've been making is while there's a lot more legal risk and there should be a valuation haircut in the United States, all you have to do is go to New Canvas Ventures and look at, you know, the revenues that are being generated in the United States uh, among the MSOs right now, and they're just getting started. And I, I get it. There's going to be a hockey stick in Canada as well for a few companies, not not that many, but you know, we're going to see uh, sales really ramp up uh, for the larger companies uh, that have uh, uh, large scale production facilities and all these contracts in hand and that are focused on the legal market. Well, in the United States where the product sets better and there's all these new markets opening and there's the M&A activity and all that, we're starting to see some really big numbers that uh, they won't get that hockey stick necessarily just like Canopy Growth and Aurora and uh, Free are going to have in the next few quarters, but the numbers are, are higher in the United States. So, so relatively speaking, do you feel the U.S. market 
has a little bit more potential than, say, the Canadian LPs who have the international side as well as the domestic uh, market here, which is approximately 10 times smaller. Yeah. Would you say the U.S. side uh, probably has a little bit higher potential for, for growth, uh, a couple, you know, a few quarters out, say six to eight quarters out? I think, yeah. Yes, I would, what I would say is there's more potential and more risk. And uh, uh, I think that's the right way to, to frame it. There's, I mean, people forget it was less than a year ago where the whole industry was, was thrown into uh, chaos uh, because the, the coal memo was rescinded and there was a lot of uncertainty about what was going to happen. And there were people that had raised a lot of money or were on the verge of raising money. And the elections, uh, I mean, this happened even before. When Donald Trump got elected, it threw uncertainty when the Republicans did the sweep, basically. And there were people that were ready to invest in uh, the U.S. cannabis industry. But after that election, they pulled back. I heard this from a lot of people and just said, sure. nope, give me my money back. I'm not investing. And uh, so it's definitely more risky in the United States. I think we're headed in the right direction. Uh, that doesn't mean we're legalizing, by the way. Uh, so everybody needs to understand. So I tell my subscribers, a 420 investor, while I think the opportunity is greater in the United States, you should be prudent. I said this even yesterday. Pick the best Canadian LPs. Uh, maybe have more exposure to the American market, but it, it, it might be imprudent to have all your eggs in the American basket. Hey, hey, Alan, uh, I, I see that Chrono said again today that they're in talks with Marlboro, uh, which is part of uh, Altria. Uh, any, any comments? Right. Like stocks, this, in Chrono stocks acting. I, you know, I'm um, this, yeah. Acting much better. Like it's, you know, it's up from about, I guess, 10, 11 bucks. Yep. I think it hit 15, currently around 13. Uh, might be a, might be a, a sort of a, a key point, right? Yeah, I was kind of con confused about why it did so well in uh, uh, November. It was uh, an outlier. It was the best performer and not even close. And uh, Canada's not known for being tight-lipped. Uh, most of these deals leak out. It was pretty amazing that the Constellation Canopy deal uh, went against that observation. But almost every other deal, it's, it's amazing how leaky things are in Canada. I had not heard anything about this. And to the point... I don't even quite understand why Kronos Group necessarily over other companies, like it would not be my first pick, nothing against the management team or anything like that, but there's other companies that seem to be more, more advanced uh, thus far anyway, but more importantly, just better values. So I, I've struggled with the Kronos valuation from, uh, for the last couple of years, so I, I might not be the right person to ask, but, uh, but in general, this would be the kind of thing the industry needs to see. Uh, there's been a lot of talk. Uh, this company in particular was rumored to be talking with uh, Afria. We had and nothing happened. Coca-Cola was speaking with Aurora and nothing happened. Uh, Diageo was supposedly going after Afria and nothing happened. So it would be nice to actually see one of these deals hit. Uh, my prediction is that we're going to see um, more of these deals, maybe a pharmaceutical company. I think it makes a lot of sense. Uh, so a pharmaceutical company that wants to get into cannabis really, in my view, has only two, three options. One is to, to just start up. And I don't think that's a great option. Two is to buy GW Pharma. I think that's a pretty darn good option. But three would be to buy a Canadian LP. It allows them to do a lot of research without uh, all the rigmarole of being a U.S. operator. Of course, if you're a, a, a multinational uh, company that might not be an issue anyway, but the Canadian LPs, it's, it's totally legal in, in Canada. It's, it's as safe a, as a haven as one could ever find to do that type of research. And we're already seeing companies in Canada like CanTrust, like Canopy Growth, uh, I'm trying to think there's some others too, that are doing these clinical trials right now already. And so uh, that, that to me going to be exciting. I think we'll see that uh, next year. Uh, finally, where we see uh, a pharmaceutical company enter the space. Okay. Sound, oh. Sounds good, Alan. Um, I guess we have to wrap it up. This segment's over, but I was going to ask you what stock you liked. Uh, what's your favorite name? If you can do that in 20 seconds before we wrap up, that'd be great. Client or no client? 
Oh boy, I you know I really don't like to do that. Uh, uh, I I will what? say that if you read what I wrote in, in my newsletter on Sunday, I mentioned a whole bunch of companies and their operating cash flows that really are radically different. And I'm kind of interested in some of those companies that are not burning cash as fast. And I'm, I'm not saying that you should avoid the ones that are, but I'm thinking that maybe some of these other companies that are better capital allocators, that, that may be a, a, something that people pick up on next year. And so. Uh, go to my newsletter at newcannabisventures.com on Sunday, and you'll you'll see at the top of the list and at the bottom of the list, and you'll figure out what I'm talking about. Thank thank you very much, Alan. Always uh, always great to hear from you from Texas, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. All thank right. you very Take thank care, you man. very much, Alan. Thanks, nice Alan. to meet you, Ben. Thank you, Alan.